Hello there. Um, welcome to my video. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Beatrix Groves McDaniel. Everybody calls me B, so please call me B. And uh, as you probably guessed, and many of you may already know, I am a transgender person, trans woman, as you might say. And this video is another in a, I suppose, a very brief series. Well, this is number two, talking about my experiences as a trans person, uh, if that's the right word. Um, these these days, I, I should point out as an aside, uh, you know, the verbiage one uses, the word, the terms and words one uses can be very often um, a bit of a minefield. So please forgive me if I'm using a term and you think I'm doing it wrongly. It's uh, just my way of speaking as an old girl. Uh, so yes, I'm going to talk to you about my experiences. And I should warn you from the very outset, these are only my experiences. I'm not here to give you chapter and verse about trans being, trans being transgender in general. I'm not here to try to establish a new norm, a new normal. I'm not here to give you what you might call research-based evidence that you have to take on board as, as gospel. You may disagree with an awful lot I've got to say, but please remember, it's my experience, and like a lot of people's experiences, well, just like everybody's experiences, it varies, and it has varied from those that you may have had or others may have had that you, you know of. I also don't want this to end up being one of what you might call one of those confessional videos in which you end up feeling sorry for me. <laughs> it's, that's not the intention. It may sound like you know a confession of one disaster after another. I've actually had quite a good and interesting life as a transgender person and I you know I'm not going to complain too much about it. It is uh, has its ups and downs, just like any other life would have. And um, it has had its sad as well as its really, really very happy parts. I'm lucky in some ways and unlucky in others. But then, who isn't? When you're reading, oh, when you're reading, when you're listening to this, you may realize I'm of a certain age. I'm actually 64 years old. I was born in 1955, so you can work out exactly which year this video was made. And yes, I know I look much younger than that, 60. <laughs> um, uh, but I wanted to tell you that because I wanted this to be a, a video that was placed in a certain era and also gave you some idea of the extent of my background. I also come from the northeast of England. Uh, which is a unique part of the world. Yes, I am a Geordie. I was born and raised and still live in Newcastle upon Tyne. And if you listen really carefully, you might hear a slight Geordie accent coming through. But uh, since I've worked for a very half my life as a, as a teacher, I've ironed out the accent somewhat because of the teaching role. Most of my life I spent in the male role. I came out as my current self in 2008. So I've had, what, uh, 50 odd years worth of doing the bloke thing, as I often refer to it, and only 12 of doing things as they are now. It seems much longer than that, I have to say. Uh, but it's only 12 years. And in the process of doing that, I've learned, I think, quite a lot about myself. I don't think of myself as being any more authentic now, if you want to use the philosophical term, than I was when I was doing the bloke thing. Um, I think that extraordinary statement is because I strongly believe that gender is a 
performance. It's something one does. Society establishes the, the, the roles that sexes have, you know, male and female sex, the biological sexes. And those roles are what we call gender. So what men do in terms of, you know, people with penises and what women do, you know, in terms of people with vaginas are different within society and some would argue because of, because of the biology, but I would suggest that the vast majority of the, what men and women do, biological men, biological women do, is a performance. They put, they, these are things they do because this is what society requires of them. Uh, only a small proportion of that is to do with the biology. The uh, vast majority of the rest of it is pretty much to do with tradition and culture and so on and so on and so forth. So when I say I'm no more authentic now than I was when I was a guy, it's the reason why is because the roles that women have in 2020 and the, the things that women do in 2020 are just as much a performance in, in practical terms as they were back in, you know, when I was 30, back in 1985 maybe, and doing the blog thing. Now, there, no, nothing really much has changed in that respect. It's not. A, this is not in itself a bad thing. I'm just saying at the end of it, and where there's more to the role of the business of gender, which is to do with performativity, as as people like Judith Butler probably would say, than uh, than um, the business of, of nature. Simone de Beauvoir said something similar about women. She, she said at the end that you know women were made, not born, and that's true because of the nature of, of, of the societies we, we, are, we are thrust into. I suppose it's quite possible that you you, know, you could have the idea of, of the male biology and the female biology and vastly differing roles and dress and all the rest of it. It's only happened this way because of social development. But this is not really what I want to talk about. I don't really want to talk about my authenticity. The authenticity, I suppose, comes into it. I want to talk about coming out. Coming out is a, well, that process of being public in the world about yourself and who you wish yourself to be perceived as. People often think of it about one's revealing one's true self, but the word true self implies that somehow, somehow you may have been living a lie prior to that. And maybe you were, but at the end of the day, that wasn't really your fault. That was the way society wanted you to be. And this is the key function, I think, of the business of coming out. Coming out is not really about revealing anything essentially different. What it's doing, as in a sense, saying is you're rebelling against society's restraints, its conceptions, its vision of you, its impositions upon you, this idea of what you're supposed to be. It's basically saying, coming out is basically saying is, I want to be seen as something, as something different. And you know, everything we see in the world is seen as, you know, read your Wittgenstein for that. And in the process of doing that, you know, the way in which people perceive, the way in which they're seen, is very much part and parcel of, of the kind of reciprocal identity process that we have on, on a social basis. In other words, who I am is because of how you perceive me. And that's been the case throughout my entire life. So when I was doing the bloke thing, and I think doing the bloke thing is a good description of it, I wasn't very good at it. I wasn't very good at it because it felt like, it felt like, it felt like I suppose, being on the stage and never being given the script. I was making it up as I was going along, and the acting wasn't very good. Uh, the rest of society didn't like that very much, and it found me difficult. It found me a difficult person to be around and be with. As a child, I was sensitive and awkward, and problematic, and fearful, and anxious, and all sorts of other things that society finds difficult. Being a sensitive, difficult, fearful, anxious child is not the kind of thing that cheers one's parent up a great deal, nor does it make one's rather conservative small-c teachers happy, nor does it 
fit you for fitting into a world around you. And those sensitivities, those sorts of anxieties, are not just about one's position with regard to one's gender, but also one's general sense of alienation from the society around one, as you might say. I remember standing in the... I was about to be about 11, 12 perhaps. I remember standing in the schoolyard one sunny day on my own and thinking to myself, is this all there is? Am I going to spend the rest of my life on railroad tracks towards my death? Am I going to end up, you know, doing O-levels, then doing A-levels, then doing university, and then getting a job, and then having a wife and 2.4 children and a car and a mortgage, and then retiring and dying? And is that all there is? Is that it? I was that sort of kid. It didn't go away. As I grew older, I became more and more awkward, and in some respects, this fed into my dissatisfaction with my sense of self in my gender. A sense of self in my gender I could hold at bay, but as society itself grew more, as you might say, oppositional to, to difference, and it didn't get any easier as time went on. As society grew more oppositional to, to difference, I, in my own turn, became less happy with the person that I was. It's not because I didn't love my, my folks, my mother, my sister, my grandparents. It's not because I didn't adore my late partner. It's not because I didn't enjoy the support of my friends and because of my colleagues at work as a teacher. But I was unhappy with the business of having to present myself as a certain kind of person in the light of that. I felt as if the effort and the process was so stressful that it was driving me slowly insane. As I grew older, it didn't, I thought it might grow less intense as I grew older. In fact, the opposite was the case. So um, by 2008, I found myself in a position where my partner at that particular time had other things in her life that were more interesting than me, you know, her grandkids and her, her kids down in London and stuff like that. And, and I found myself feeling quite alone, quite, I suppose, neglected would have been the word, emotionally if not physically, and also stressed out about a sense of unreality about who I was. And that pushed me towards the business of, of coming out. Coming out wasn't revealing myself, it was about a sense of protest, I suppose. It was about saying, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm going to be me, whoever that me happens to be. And it just so happens it was Beatrix, Elizabeth, Groves, later Groves, McDaniel, with great legs and tush, you know, boobs and the full, oh, the whole nine yards. And I guess that was a, well, I don't guess, I know, that was a shock to everyone. Because coming out is a shock, let's admit it to us. For those around us, when you reveal this to the world, when you say to people, hold on, I'm not there, I'm there. When you do that, other people are going to go, excuse me? At best. And erect, uh, erect? <laughs> reply or respond uh, in horror at worst. And the curious thing about it is, the closer they are to you, the more likely they are to respond in horror. Because they have an emotional connection. They have a emotional connection to the history of you. They think it's an emotional connection to you. But in fact, what they have is that history that's built up, that sense of that long passage of time that they've known you and fed into the person that's you through their reactions, through their expectations, through their assumptions and stereotypes about you. And in the process of doing that, that's given them a sense of security about who you are. And then you come along and tell them to their face that really that was all rubbish, that all their assumptions were wrong. So naturally, 
the closer they are to you with emotional ties, the more likely they are to react badly. And by badly, I mean to say react, re, they react to reject you out of hand. Not you, but the rebellious you, the coming out you, the new you, as you might say, even though it's not new. The new you will be rejected out of hand. And this is why you often find when, especially transgender people come out, because they come out in a big way, when they come out, very often families will reject them out of hand. It is because of that close connection. That close connection is stymied, it is corrupted, as you might say, by the very act. And it's made worse by the sense of social guilt and the sense of social affront that comes with it. For transgender people, as you well know, the business of change is very much about appearance. It's very much about changing how you appear in the world. It's not your sexuality. Your sexuality very often just stays exactly the way it was. It may be expressed differently, but it's not changing much. You may find out things about yourself you didn't know, but for the most part, they were always there. Just you hadn't recognized them. But how you, how you show yourself to the world is part of the business of coming out. It's the dressing. It's wearing the frock. It is the change in the hair. It is the makeup. It is the earrings. It is, I'm not wearing nail varnish, but you get the idea. It is the different jewelry. It is the bra, the panties, the tights, stockings, whatever it happens to be. The high heels, maybe? Whatever. It is that change that people who are close to you see as an affront to their confidence in you as a person. Made worse by the famous, what will the neighbours say, system. In other words, how does the idea that not only are you causing disruption in that connection that they have with you, but they are also causing them social embarrassment. They don't want the burden of having to explain to Mr. and Mrs. Jones next door who this tall woman is coming and going on a regular basis to your house. And why the other person that used to live there is no longer there. That's heavy stuff. It's heavy stuff if you rec recognize it by thinking about it yourself. Think about what would happen in your situation. Now, I, I, whenever, I talk, I talk about, uh, whenever I talk about this sort of thing in public, you know, I do do lectures and talks. So if you want to book me, book me. When I talk about this, I often say to audiences, I warn them that there is a small possibility, a small possibility, but necessarily a possibility, that at some point in time, somewhere in their family, someone in their family, somewhere in that close to, will do exactly what I'm describing right now. And the thing to think about is not, oh dear, how sad, never mind, or oh, I shall be fine, but think about what you would actually feel at that point. And if you're going to come out, think about how you're going to cope with those feelings coming from people you thought you knew. The reaction you will get will be dependent upon the relationship you had with your friends, colleagues, neighbours, family, partner before you came out. It will be heavily dependent on that. It will be depending on, depending on how open, how relaxed, how liberal is not, probably not the right word, but it's the closest one I can get. If it was predicated, if the relationship you had prior to coming out was heavily predicated on the business of you being a certain kind of person, you know, the macho man, the sportsman, the breadwinner, the highly stereotypical focus kind of image, there is going to be problems when you come out. If it was a very much more, I don't know, maybe liberal modernistic kind of approach, you may find it's somewhat easier, but not lacking in problems. There will be problems, but probably not the same ones you, you would get if your image prior to that was stereotyped. So, to foretell what the, the, the outcome will be, think about your current relationship. That will give you some guidance. And you have to be honest with yourself about it. You also have to be honest with, with yourself 
with regard to the business of coming out and the fact that you're probably going to end up losing things. This is the price you pay for the change you're making. You may lose a lot or you may lose very little. Depends on luck rather than good management or good judgment. It very much depends on circumstances. It very much depends on, as I said, those previous relationships. It would be very surprising if you didn't lose anything at all. But the chances are you're going to end up having to have a different sort of life. Perhaps a life which is better. I think in general, after a few years, looking back on it, you probably will believe it to be to be better than it was. Because at least from your point of view, the psychological stress will be removed, but it won't go away precisely. You will just have another set of problems than the ones you started off with. Except these will be manageable ones, apart from being, you know, <laughs> complicated, but they will be manageable at the very least. The old ones were just unmanageable, full stop. The current ones are, are, are at least manageable. The crucial thing here is to maintain some sort of contact with people who are rejecting you and give, keep the door open for them to continue to make contact. It is not to pressure them, pressure them but to give them the opportunity to say, OK, I've got over the shock. What kind of relationship could I have with you? And if they're honest people, they're honest about themselves, honest about their relationships, honest about their confident status in society, then they will consider that. If they're dishonest about themselves, you know, if, you're, if you've been part of a dishonest relationship, then coming out won't make it honest. It may just reveal what has been hidden there all the time, that the person you were living with wasn't really honest about their own feelings or about their own sexuality or about them, their sense of prejudice against people of difference. It'll just reveal things that were hidden away. But if you're lucky, you may find that you get a new kind of status of relationship with, with relatives, friends, and so on, which you didn't have before. The great thing is you also make a whole lot of whole new friends and which compensates for, for the, some, some, to a certain extent, for the losses you get. But keeping the door open to re retain and remaining in contact, I think, is a, is a good thing. You may be looking to do that because it very often hurts to be rejected in a big way, but keeping that door open is a great psychological, it, 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 psychological support for hope within relationships. Can I now speak to those who are reacting to a person who has come out as transgender and who's living a life of gender expression which was, they were not assigned at birth. Can I say to you, please, please, to have some patience. You may not be able to understand right now, but please have some patience. In the initial stages of someone coming out, there is a slight sense of madness overtakes individuals. Madness in the sense that they are overwhelmed by the freedom of their new role and consequently it may end up failing and sounding like someone totally alien. But this does go away. Last, from my point of view, it lasts roughly speaking about a year and then suddenly starts to settle down again. So have patience with the person concerned. If you valued your relationship with them for years and years and years over their life and want to retain something of that into the future, even if it's not quite the same, then surely that's of value. You could, if not be their lover, then be their closest, closest, most intimate friend and partner in life. Or maybe think of them as more than friends, but a bit less than partner, maybe. That's a good compromise, and it not only gives you a sense of contact and continuity, but also a revival of love in a different kind of way, a different manner of loving someone. If, you're friend, if you've got a friend who's coming out as, tra as trans, please be supportive. Don't run away from them. 
they're going through traumatic processes. They sometimes don't know how to react. They may be highly embarrassing at times. They may be difficult. But please, be supportive. They need you. They don't need your advice. They may need your shoulder to cry on. They may need you to be a drinking partner. They may need you to be a person to tell them funny stories occasionally, to cheer them up. You need to be somebody they can talk to on the phone for an hour or so and moan on about things. They need somebody like that. And if the position was reversed, to think about how you would need them because they would give you that support in return. And probably now they're in their new role, they would have more opportunity, more freedom to do so. So this is an, this you know, supporting a trans person is in many respects a good investment of, of, of type, of kind. Above all, try not to get too angry. It's not down to you. It's not about you. Coming out and revealing, someone revealing something about themselves is not about you. It wasn't about them lying to you. Very often what they've done is hidden who they are since birth, hidden their expression, hidden themselves away, and been frightened to death that anyone would find out. And eventually the tension has got so strong that they had no other choice in the matter. So please, try to understand that. They're not doing it because they've lied. They've done it because they just wanted to fit in. They wanted to fit in, and fitting in was all they had going for them. And yes, they do love you, still. They may not seem it. It may seem in the madness that's overtaking them right now, but they don't. But they still do. So please, don't get. try not to get too angry. You have every right to be angry, but don't try to get too angry and be permanently angry. And don't predicate your life on being angry. Don't make your whole reason at raison d'etre hate. Eventually, at some point in time, you realise that you're losing something because of that hate. And that hate will not make you feel any better. It will not give you better, a better world to live in. It will not make you your future relationships that you might have any more secure. Deal with this now on an understanding and hopeful basis and you'll discover that whether you want to stay with the person who's come out or not, at least at the end you will have been honest with yourself, honest with them and in the future you will be able to be honest with the peop other people you have relationships with. But to react with hate and anger and rejection is to fail to deal with the problem. I think that's about all I want to say about all this. Can I remind you that everything I've said is my opinion? It's an informed opinion. Uh, well, you may disagree with the cell sources of information, Judith Butler, Wittgenstein. You want to go uh, various psychologists of various types, um, but it is only my position. So please don't think that you have to think this way. But I hope the provocation of me talking about it has been useful. Thanks for listening, whatever the case, and have a good time, have a good week. Have a good future and stay safe out there. Bye-bye <laughs> for now.